I was arrested on the 28th of December. You may have heard this on social media and news outlets, but not all of them covered the entire truth. Not previously was I able to mention and say a lot of what had happened to me. And obviously a lot of Islamist trolls along with other Tanzanian trolls decided to make up false lies about my arrest. I was convicted with no charges, was never taken to court, I have nothing on my file and my Australian passport was stolen by the Tanzanian authorities after they arrested me. This started in October and not in December. I flew to Tanzania in September for a family emergency. What was meant to be a three-week trip ended up being six months long and none of it was within my control. On the, on the last week of October, or sometime in between October, there was a Facebook group that alerts people about dark crimes. So Dar es Salaam is the capital city and crimes or any, anything warning the general public about any crimes. Someone from the community, now I had already received a lot of threats from the community explicitly shown, explicitly shown to journalists and posted on Facebook. But I had received a specific comment when I wasn't even in the group and people sent me screenshots of it saying that, you know, I'll put, I'll put the comment on it. But the idea was to basically frame me and put me in prison because of my anti-religious views. And while Tanzania is a secular country and there were no laws that I was breaking, that was still considered a threat and was taken down. Luckily, I had a screenshot of it and immediately a week later, I contacted the Australian consulate, sent them the screenshots and asked them, what should I do if this actually comes in play? Their response was, well, we can't get involved, but let us know. Why don't you go to the authorities, the Tanzanian authorities and tell them? And I'm like, so you want me to tell them that they're planning to frame me for being against the government based on my religious views? And that made no sense at all. They were not helpful. So I continued to do what I was doing in Tanzania, which was working from home, being with my family. It was the first time in 12 years that I had actually visited them for over a month. I usually go there for a week in a few years and it's always during work. But because we had the ability for working from home, that was a possibility. Um, and then a month and a half later, so early December, this is weeks before my arrest, I get a message from the police. At that time, I didn't know it was the police. I just get a phone call on my local Tanzanian number saying, hello, is this Zara? And, I'm, and I answer and I'm like, hello, yes. Like, who is this? And he speaks to me in Swahili. And I try responding saying, I'm busy. I'll call you back later because my Swahili isn't that great. And that was... That was when I texted him on WhatsApp using my local number asking where he got my number from. Now I was working with a lot of orphanages so it could have been a possibility that it was given out that way but I had never heard of his name. I don't remember anyone and he's like it's Jackson and I'm like can you send me a selfie because I don't know if I've ever given you my number. He's like oh yeah you gave it to me last week and I'm like I was at home last week I never gave you my number. So it sends me a photo and I'm like, no, I'm sorry, I don't recognize you and you're harassing me. And he's like, oh, just meet me once and I'll change your mind. And he kept pursuing me um, and I just blocked him. And his last message was, we will meet again and or, or I will see you again. Um, and that made no sense to me. It was creepy. So evidently I went to my brother and told him, do you recognize this number? He's been harassing me. And his last message was really creepy. So my brother calls him from his phone and a woman picks up. And the woman is like, oh, you know, this is happy. And my brother's like, who is Jackson? And she's like, oh, that's my brother. And he's like, can you tell Jackson not to harass my sister? And that's where it ended, or so we thought. I was meant to fly, and that was in early December. And I was meant to fly after the 26th of December. But on the 24th, and it was meant to be a last minute ticket because we didn't have any COVID tests um, required at the time to go back to the UK. And tickets were quite cheap because it was during Christmas time and everything 
was um, ev and everything was um, cheaper but after like after that phone call and three weeks later or two weeks later on the 24th my brother receives a call from the cyber crime unit and this is a day before Christmas right and they're like hey there's a complaint about you you need to come to the police station and my brother is like, what is this about? And they're like, oh, we can't tell you over the phone. You have to come to the police station. My brother insists on a written summon delivered to him and then he'll attend. They call him on the 25th during Christmas Day. And they're like, we have the written summon, but you have to come pick it up to the at the police station. And we call a general lawyer who has worked with us before. None, none of that kind of a civil case. It was just business law or something. We call him and we're like, what do we do? And the lawyer's like, you know, it's a public holiday, so they can't insist on it. And if nobody's dying, I will tell them my client will attend on a Monday. So the 28th was a Monday. I go with my brother. I'm in the car, so they don't know I, had, I was actually around the area. But my brother goes in with the lawyer. And then five, seven minutes later, he calls me and he's like, Sarah, this is about you and your Facebook post. Now, just a week before or a few days before that incident, I had posted up a picture of two men kissing in front of the Muslim black box, the Kaaba. Evidently, I was startled why they would even call him in and not me. Um, and it made no sense. So before I went in the police into the police station, I tweeted in because it was the obvious scenario that I was being arrested for something. As soon as I get in, they have no idea what my legal name is. They don't even know that I am not Tanzanian. And they asked for my national ID card. And I look at them puzzled and I'm like, what ID card? And they're like, your NIDA card, your Tanzanian NIDA card. And I'm like, I'm not Tanzanian. I am a tourist. And they're like, what? But your siblings are Tanzanians, your, bro your brother's Tanzanian. And I'm like, yeah, but I am not. And, you know, they were like, where's your Australian passport? Like, where are you from? And I'm like, Australian. They're like, where's your Australian passport? And I'm like, this wasn't about me. Why, like, why do I need to present a passport? And they're like, well, this is about your social media posts. And I'm like, then why do you arrest my brother? So they didn't know my name. They didn't know where I was from. And then... They were so confused and really threatened when I asked them what charges they were for. And they showed me a post that I wrote about the president in May when I was in London. And I'm like, well, I wasn't in Tanzania at the time, so this doesn't really stand. And then they started yelling at me in Swahili and I could understand, I can't speak. And they were threatening me. They were trying to intimidate me and I knew I had no charges. I mean... If I had any charges, it should have been quite evidently and strong and not responsed with threats my way. Um, I was taken to the interrogation room where I was in there for about six hours. So not having eaten in the morning, having eaten the night before was about 22 hours of no food and I had water. And the police officer, Majuto, so Joseph was the one who arrested me and Majuto was my investigating officer. When he had the form, the form had religion and I was like, none, I am an atheist. And he just looked at me. He's like, what? What is an atheist? And I'm like, I don't believe in a God. And he's like, but your family is Muslim. And I'm like, yes, and I am not. And he was so puzzled. Um, and in the time of my interrogation, he asked about my charity. So, because he's like, what do you do for work? And I'm like, I run a charity and I work for um, a technology company. And they are like, what does your charity do? What are its objectives? And I was like, well, my charity helps women from honor-based abuse, helps what mostly women have left Islam. And he had to write all of that down. None of his fucking business, but he did it anyway. And then... With Majuta specifically, while we were in the car, and, and I'll get to that, and during the whole interrogation period until my charges were dropped, he kept asking me questions like, why did you leave Islam? And when I'd respond, he'd go like, no, 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 you're disturbing my mind. I shouldn't ever doubt God. Or, you know, you should come back to Islam. It's such a beautiful religion. And he would probe my siblings and ask them why I left Islam. 
none of that made any sense. Um, especially because my charges on paper were being interrogated about a post that I wrote about the president or two posts that I wrote about the president while I wasn't in Tanzania. They were not insulting posts at all. They were just criticism on his handling of COVID-19. And it was written ages ago. So I had been in Tanzania for four months at that time. And what they told the media was that it was on immigration issues. I had none. I entered with my Australian passport, never used my Tanzanian passport. My fingerprints remained the same within me changing those passports from when I had a Tanzanian and the Australian passport. I renewed my visa legally four times before they came up with the immigration charges. None of that stood in the law of court. There is no charge against you not surrendering your passport. It's only when you use it um, and you have another citizenship, which I never did. And going back to the interrogation room, as we went on, the police officer, Majuto, in, like, intentionally delayed the entire um, investigation. He would just be on his WhatsApp, laugh and send messages. And I'm like, what are you doing? Can we finish this? And he would delay it and delay it. And then they made me sign. And then I went like, I'm ending this interrogation because I'm tired. I haven't had my pills. I have anxiety. And I, I, I want to go eat. And if there's nothing more, then I want to leave. And my lawyer suggested that we end it and we can continue the next day. I signed the statement. So they wrote the statement and made me sign it. And, you know, they asked about my background, what citizenship my parents had, as though we were foreigners when, you know, my, probably my great grandfather was born in Tanzania, like we've been there for generations. And that's, you know, that's the only information I know. Um, and, you know, I asked them to show me the law that says that I need to return my passport. And they're like, and they show me the law on dual citizenship. And I'm like, yeah, but this doesn't say anything about the passport being returned. You're not allowed to hold dual citizenship. But that as soon as you get a new citizenship, your old Tanzanian one is revoked. And, you know, he just ignored my question. Um, and then after the interrogation, I didn't know where I was being taken. And I was just shoved in a car. And when I was in the car, they wouldn't turn on the air condition, they wouldn't turn out in the windows. And it was like 30 something degrees. And it was really hot because it was about five or 6 p.m. at this time. And I just screamed that I'm getting a panic attack and they need to open the windows. And they did after I screamed, but I asked them multiple times before, multiple times before. And before I got into the car having, I didn't know where I was going, but before I got into the car, my brother told me, remember the guy who was harassing you, Jackson? And he's like, yeah, he is a police officer. And I'm like, okay, cool. So that's when things started building all up. They were following me for a month, for like a month at least, so a few weeks. And, you know, I was taken, you know, they asked me where I lived and I was taken home without a search warrant. They had no search warrant. Come into my house, had, I didn't have the keys at the time because I didn't know where I was going. So we waited for my sister to bring the keys. And, you know, they searched the house, found nothing except my Kindle. I don't know what they were searching for. It looked like they were searching for other devices that I couldn't communicate with anybody else. Not that this is legal, by the way. All of this is, un like, all of this is illegal, especially it was done during the Christmas break. And not all of the police officers were working because you could see all, like, most of the doors were shut of the police. There was only one office or one or two offices that were open that all the police who or like you know three or four of the police who interrogated me took me to the house were involved in all of this was really surprising when I got back um, to the police station after the house search um, my other sisters ha had shown them the Australian passport and they took it never returned it um, and, you know, they finally went like, we're going to put her in jail. But before they did that, they took another statement, removing the posts of the president that I wrote 
and writing a new fresh statement and making it as though it was an immigration and a SIM card charge. And even then I was like, I'm not signing this statement because it's not complete and you're not writing that you put me in this room for seven hours before all of this and you went to my house without a warrant. So they forced me to sign the statement saying that if I didn't do it, they'll put my family in jail as well. And he said, it's his police station and he can do whatever he wants. Now this is Joseph from the cybercrime unit who had initially called me in. Um, and I signed it because what else could I have done? Um, before I went to prison, like the prison cell, I was in a room eating and I was wearing really loose, you know, backpacker pants, like, you know, Hawaiian, like Thailand kind of pants and a t-shirt. And I was eating and I was seated cross-legged and you could see a bit of my ankle and a police officer comes in and he's like, you're provoking me. And I'm like, excuse me? He's like, your legs, the way you're sitting, it's like you're teasing me. And I was like, you're not wearing like long sleeves, like your arms are showing. And he's like, yeah, but you're a woman. And then he proceeds to ask me if I had a boyfriend, if I was married. And then he starts making se sexual innuendos. He's like, I'll marry you. And I'm like, no. And I was so freaked out, like it was so strange to me to be in a room with somebody who thinks my ankles turn him on or my, or the way I'm sitting. Like I've never been around such people. And it was, it was, it was very new to me. And then the police officer finally says, you know, when I reject all of his, um, all of his advances on me, he finally says, oh, I'll give you a present before you leave. And I had no idea what that meant. And I just was silent. And then when I was taken to prison, I was alone. And then two other girls came in and they were crying. And I was like, oh, what are you in here for? They're like, oh, we just made some noise and somebody arrested us. And I was like, okay, cool. Then we just chatted a little. And they came in at about midnight-ish. Um, and before the sun came out, so at 6 a.m., three police officers got into my prison cell, were not expecting those other two women, and the person who did say that I was provoking him went on while I was sleeping to touch my face and wake me up, and he tried groping my face, and I screamed, and they freaked out, and they left. Um, and, you know... The next day, you know, they refused, the police officers, the senior police officers who had arrested me, refused to lodge my bail. And by this time, we had already hired another lawyer who was more um, competent in the area. Um, or so we thought. I say that because we paid a lot of money for him, like more than he actually invoiced for, because, you know, he probably was avoiding tax. Um, but we were desperate and we just wanted the lawyer to, you know, figure out what was happening. And they refused bail until a while later, um, like at night, you know, at like 9 p.m., they let me out. Now, in the meantime, my friends who had already made a group, including Yasmin Mohammed on it, um, were in you know, they were in the group trying to figure out what had happened. And as soon as I got out, the first thing I did was take my sister's phone and tell them, hey guys, I'm doing fine. Um, so it wasn't really blasphemy, but you know, this is where it came from. And this is like, you know, this is what happened. Like they didn't have any grounds to arrest me. They wouldn't show me the law. They asked me about this. They asked me about that. And then, you know, I was a little startled. I'm like, you can't tell people I've been on, I've been released on bail until my lawyer says so. Um, and then the next day, my lawyer, you know, said it's it's okay to say you've been on bail, um, that you're out on bail, um, but you have to report in two days later. And so I waited until I reported in, and they told me to come in four days later to go to the immigration. So that was the thirty first. So I was out on twenty ninth. 31st I reported and then at night I went out and committed the biggest sin ever with that was eating cheesecake 
It's really funny that people felt the need to make music videos, not understand any of the context or anything. But what was really disappointing was somebody with such a high profile who handles vulnerable cases felt the need to pass on confidential information about a case out of context and basically try sabotaging my safety because of some personal issue that person may have had with me and what is worse is that it was passed on to somebody who has clearly been so obsessed with me and has gone on to make 15 videos about me sometimes naming me sometimes not but it's really obvious that in this whole time you know they did not care where I was and they were like oh my god she used her sister's sim card she should be in jail they had no fucking idea how Tanzanian politics run. And if you're from Tanzania, there's something you should already know. That my community is possibly one of the richest community and have so much influential political power that a lot of others don't. And they're very capable of doing what they did to me. And you would know this if you were living there. So it doesn't matter if they're 0.2% of the population. They're filthy rich. Everybody has connections anywhere they want and it wasn't a surprise that you know I was released not convicted of any charges but my passport was stolen the police declared it lost now going back to the 31st when I ate the cheesecake which was very delicious um, and you know spending time with my family it helped us realize that the only way we can beat everything and everybody who's against us was by being together. So we made the most of my time. While I was still technically on bail, I wasn't free to go. I couldn't go out alone because there were people who wanted to behead me because I was in the news. I couldn't go to, I couldn't, I couldn't stay at home alone. So there was always somebody at home and we installed cameras and everything to make sure that I was safe. I couldn't drive alone that, you know, I had to wait until a sibling picked me up. It had to be a family member who was watching after me. And when I told the Australian authorities about them, and I'm like, you know, I've told you about this case and you're taking such a long time to even respond or act anything on it. And their solution was, why don't you finish it under the table? I don't know what that means, but that was not legal that they were trying to insinuate and there was no way I was going to do it because not only does it endanger me, it endangers my family who live there. There was no way I would do anything illegal or encourage that, especially because when the news went out about me and the government claimed it was immigration, and that was even before I left the immigration office that they even leaked my personal details, it was... It was scary because then my family was in trouble as well. But we were also receiving anonymous calls and threats. Somebody from the community saying, oh, we need to take Zara out of Tanzania. She's not safe. I have backdoor ways. And I was like, no, there is no way I am going through any of that. We're paying tons of money to this lawyer who's meant to finish the case and assured us that there were no charges and that you know the, there were no grounds to arrest given that he knows the law. But after week two, so this is after New Year's, when I went to immigration and was threatened by the immigration, I came home and two days later, my lawyer tells me my passport is stolen, my Australian passport. And I asked him to let the Australian consulate know that this is what he has heard. He failed to do that because I think it was around the same time that the police had told him that they were paid a bribe to get my passport stolen. And this was information they didn't want me to relate to the public because it endangers me even more. Although I did email the Australian consulate as soon as I found out that my passport was lost. And their recommendation was as soon as my charges were dropped and that I have a lost report that they'll send me a new passport and that, you know, they've sent me the form and the documents and what I need and everything. And um, my lawyer's not only competency, but his loyalty was also questioned, given that after he knew all that information, he failed to act on 
behalf of me by demanding to see that passport from the police, by asking for the charges, by pushing this case forward, by even talking to the Australian consulate about my case. So his, his loyalty was in deep, in deep, indeed, sorry. His loyalty was indeed questionable. I don't know what else had gone to it, but I'll leave that up to the viewers. Um, the only person I could trust at that point, given that there were friends and people from the community who were trying to get more information because they knew that we knew this was on a bribe. It made no sense. And we had actually police officers who were with me on that first day who arrested me admit to taking a bribe from somebody from the community and other sources. Of course, I can't name them for legal reasons. And, you know, you don't have to take my word for, him, for it, but the Tanzanian government did not persecute me. The file went up to the highest level, the, de the director of public prosecutor. This is a guy who handles terrorist cases as well. So any high profile case goes up to him. It came back with no grounds to arrest and I had no charges and I was issued a lost report. And all of this happened when my brother went to the police station and told them that if I didn't, if I didn't get a lost report or an end to the judgment, because it's been six weeks that, you know, six weeks since my arrest, that I would start talking to the journalists and tell them everything and how they threatened me, how they intimidated me, how they threatened my family and how in immigration I was told that if I spoke about it, they would hurt my dad. But I'm still taking this risk to tell my truth. And hopefully we've had enough measures and the change of government to have ever let any of this happen again to us. Anyway, but now that we know my lawyer wasn't really being helpful, my brother had so had, I think every single day went to the police office just to have a meeting with um, the the. the the deputy regional officer, a woman. And every time I had to go to report in, I was met with sexist comment from men in power asking me if I was married and they would marry me because I need an African man in my life. And that is abusive and harassment. And I went and I complained about the sexual harassment in jail to the deputy of regional officer, DCO, so commissioner officer or something, Shamila, and I told her, and I'm like, do you know what it feels like? Like you're a woman and do your colleagues come and tell you that you need an African man in your life? Well, because I get that every time I come into this police station, I was sexually assaulted in jail with this guy making so many innuendos and I complained and I did file it. And I told them how scared I was to come back to the police station and they made me do it anyway and they held on to my case anyway and they knew I knew that they lost their passport and I put it out there and they felt more threatened and I'm like well I've already told the Australian consulate that you've lost my passport anyway six weeks later when my brother did push for an outcome and we finally got the lost report and my charges were dropped the Australian consulate failed to give me my passport because the news had gone so high up and my lawyer had even sent them an affidavit saying that my charges have been dropped and it should be that it should be noted that I am in danger in Tanzania especially now that my charges have been dropped and I've received a lot of threats the Australian consulate still failed and it was until I got three additional lawyers from Dowdy Street who were amazing by the way. The moment they had a meeting with the Mar with Marissa Payne's office, DFAT, two hours later is when I got my passport printed and sent to me. And that's, and that's how I was able to fly out. However, while the passport was sent to me on the 21st, this caused me the loss of job in the UK because my visa expired on the 18th but my charges were dropped on the 16th so I could have still made it in the UK. Got a visa transfer but I couldn't do that because Australia ignored a lot of what they had said. They wanted evidence that the charges were dropped and I provided them with everything but they wanted Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Tanzania to go like, oh, we arrested one of your citizens. She had no charges, so we're letting her go because we can't take her to court. So I hope it's okay. Um, and that was a stupid 
thing that they actually even wanted as part of a response from the government. It would have never happened. And my lawyer sent them an email saying, that's never going to happen. You're never going to hear back about her case. And that you have to protect your citizen and that it is not on you to decide whether or not she deserves her passport. She is your citizen. So I got a passport, booked my flight. I was denied flight. I was denied getting past immigration because the police who dropped my case didn't do their due diligence by erasing my name on the no-fly list. Now, I was arrested on the 28th. The news in Australia came out on the 3rd of January, which was the second in Tanzania, and then they saw it in the early of the 3rd. Despite me being arrested on the 28th and them losing my passport before the 3rd, I was put on a no-fly list on the 3rd, so not when I was arrested, but only when the media went live in Australia talking about my arrest as an activist and why I was arrested. Anyway, I couldn't make that flight. My brother also couldn't make it. My brother bought an additional flight to make sure that I got out of there safe. We lost all that flight, we lost all that money, and we bought another flight. Um, And during that time, my brother went to the immigration to make sure that the police had actually cleared my name. And fortunately, two hours before we were heading to the airport, they updated their systems and I was finally able to fly. But the first flight, I was detained again and they wanted to take my new passport away from me, to which my brother said that passport is not going out of sight and I have a right to contest it. The police officer there, and I have a video for this, I won't be uploading it, but the police officer there in Swahili says, who do you think you are? This is protocol, we need to take the passport. I can do whatever I want. I'm going to arrest you and your family because you can't talk to me like that. Only because my brother said this passport is not going out of sight. So whatever you do, you need to do it here. If you're making a call, you make a call here or you leave the passport with me. And then in the end, when my brother did fight, we finally like did put up a fight. They didn't fight, but did put up a fight. We finally got the passport, the new passport at this time because they stole my first one. Um, And I was able to leave. I mean, my brother played a really big part in helping me talk to the authorities because not only did my lawyer fail, but the community had paid so much money to go through all the trouble and embarrassing the Tanzanian government. And how do I know it was the community? Well, we had three different sources confess it to us and tell us. I got to Australia and I was told the exact person who did this to me, who's in the leadership board of the community, And this is something they need to figure out because I'm done. I will still criticize and I'll still continue doing what I do. And the best form of justice for me is to go on with my life, continue kicking ass and continue saying my truth. And they can figure out who did this and why, because according to me, I've done my due diligence and informed intelligence agencies about them. And that's the best I can do. And... As for you guys, you can either take my word for how I was arrested and what had actually happened, or you can go back and look at all the cheesecake videos because, oh my God, why would Zara eat cheesecake videos? They're so jealous because cheesecake is amazing. Um, But this was the entire story and it sounds like a 007. And at this point, now that I've settled down, I can't imagine anybody having to go through with that having nobody to trust except your family, and even there, not even then not having a justice system that would give you any correct information. Like they were, all of them were purely just driven by money. And that was the sad part. That's the Tanzania we live in. And if you check the recent news in Tanzania, a lot of the activists who were jailed previously are now being let out with no reason because there was no reason for their arrest. Only because the previous president wanted it, it could have happened. And that's what my community played on. Because they think that the previous president would be so offended over me saying that he failed during the handling of COVID-19. And I wasn't in Tanzania, by the way. Um, So now they would arrest any foreigners who don't agree with them. That sounds absurd. But we have a change of government, which is... A little hopeful, even though it's not completely 
even though it's not completely what everybody else would have accepted for many different reasons, but it is hope for change. And this is it, and this was my story. Um, I expect you to put in the comments below what your favorite che cheesecake is. Um, and for many different reasons, I won't be answering any questions about this because I've put the entire truth out there. I have filled up the timeline. I have mentioned every incident and how even other ex-Muslims couldn't even see beyond their bubble because they grew up in the West and have no idea about Tanzanian politics. And it was a Tanzanian activist who supported me during this because they knew exactly what was happening and they knew exactly how this would play out. And if you actually want to verify facts, go to them and chat to them and ask them what Tanzania is like and how money rules a lot of this and politics is corrupt. Like the Tanzanian authorities are corrupt and that's changing, which is a great thing. But no, go, go, go watch the cheesecake video to see how absurd their theories are and how much time they put into my personal life to make videos because, oh my God, cheesecake. That's it for now. Thank you.